roll relevant again. So this is the fourth and sixth. Uh, the direction of pace changes next week. These were the last two. Um, so, but you'll recognize how this goes just for the last three. Um, it, it's an interesting to me, to me today to look back over what we've done. And, um, and we really have the outlines of a science creation story. I mean, that's really what's happened over the last several weeks because of just putting it together. Um, I mean, let's face it, compared to 1900, we know the universe um, had a beginning. We didn't know that in 1900. The universe had a beginning. We didn't even know the universe had an atom then, for sure. So it has an atom. Uh, so it had a beginning. We also know that a lot of it, a lot of stuff happened in those first few seconds, even, even minutes, but certainly seconds, where the universe inflated faster than the speed of light, many times faster than the speed of light, and all the elementary forces and all the um, all the particles came to be. Uh, and the simplest of the elements being hydrogen, so just one proton, and helium, two protons. Um, but they're just ions. They couldn't form atoms yet. It was too hot. Um, but anyway, I don't want to get into the details, but that's what all, that's what happened in that very brief period. And then it was hundreds of millions of years, we're not quite sure, uh, but before the first stars formed. And the first, star, first stars formed, I mean, we learned that, that stars have a beginning, they have an interim, and they have an ending. And then some part of them goes on in the formation of other stars to come in later, later generations. So beginning, interim, end, recreation. That's a common theme biologically uh, and in the in, inanimate world. So that's another part of the science creation story. Also, uh, a general trend from uh, simplicity, welcome, from simplicity to complexity. That happens biologically. I mean, for two billion years, we had single cells, albeit uh, more complex single cells at around a one and a half billion year mark, but simple cells. And then uh, they began to congregate with one another, uh, became multicellular organisms, a very complex multicellular or organism like us. So that's on the biological side. And then those, as I said, with the Big Bang, only three elements created then, and not very much lithium, except just the tiniest little bit. The rest were all created in stars or with the death of stars. So again, creation, interims, endings, recreation happened. We've, part of the story is that life is carbon based. And I think the most extraordinary thing about life is not only that, that life to hold, but that, that it, um, uh, that we're related to every other living being or cell that's ever been. We are related to them because the basic molecules of life are the same. From the simplest of cells to us and all of our cells. So our, our ancestral connections are very deep and very broad. Um, so all life is, is related. That, that's an interesting lesson. We don't behave that way. But, but it's true. Uh, just on the human part, it took five to six million years for us to really kind of develop and come on stage. Anatomically modern humans, say around 200,000 years ago, we don't know how long complex, nuanced language has been around, but probably that or, or longer. Uh, but with that came imagination and this urge, this strong urge, to create stories, to tell stories, to share stories. And that's part of art, and that's part of what would evolve later into uh, complex religious beliefs and systems. So those, have, those, those roots go back maybe 200, 300,000 years, maybe a, little bit, maybe a little bit longer. We don't know, we don't have those records. 
But so that's kind of the outline of if 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 I were writing or anyone else was writing a British historical science, that's what it would be. But it has implications for every other creation story. Because the natural laws are there, like for as long as the universe is here. Uh, so the things that guided the formation of stars, that guided the formation of elements, how long they hang around, uh, how uh, various atoms form different kinds of molecules and form the molecules of life, that's basic physics and chemistry. And it runs right through the whole story for as long as life has been around. So enough preaching on that. Hey, here's a little perspective. Um, I think I probably mentioned this, but matter being us, what we see, what we touch, what we're familiar with, that's less than 5% of the universe. Dark matter is five or six times more common. Dark matter is stuff that doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, interact with the electromagnetic spectrum, so you can't see it, so it's dark. And the energy of continuing the expansion, the universe is still expanding. Uh, in fact, it's speeding up, it's accelerating. Uh, uh, that's dark energy. Uh, there's another way of looking at this simple plot, or pi here. It, we, uh, there's a lot of mystery concerning 95% of that pi. We don't know actually what dark matter is. We know how it behaves but no one's actually seen it or identified it. And, uh, and, we're, and, and we know about dark energy because that's behind the force of acceleration of the universe, but okay, but what, what actually is it? And uh, so there are mysteries here. Uh, well, let's just move along. Uh, we're talking about singularities. That's a term that was introduced in the uh, series of 19... Uh, uh, 1915, 16, 17, uh, but, but it's strongly re related to black holes. In fact, black holes are very closely related uh, in some features to, to the beginning of the universe. I mean, it began with the singularity, something incredibly dense, energy, pure energy, an incredible amount of it, but a singularity, meaning a very dense spot. And uh, how small? Incredibly small. Uh, but it's also at the root of black holes. Uh, so there are similarities. Well, there's a black hole, and um, I'm not going to talk a lot about that. There's just there to put the title on. But I want to bring this up because uh, it, uh, part of this series is about how science works. And a lot of major projects in science are long you know, they've been going on a long time, you know, two, three, four decades, and, and they've required continuous funding. Well, this is one, the so-called Event Horizon Telescope, which really what they've done is they gained uh, uh, several radio uh, telescopes together and collect the information uh, from several of these uh, uh, scopes and, uh, and then um, uh, I'll show you how that happens. But you know what strikes me when I look at it? These are the stations that are or countries or where these uh, radio telescopes are. <laughs> look at where they're not. I don't see any in Russia. I don't see any in the Arab world. Uh, I don't see any in Africa. I see one, uh, main one, in, uh, in all of South America. Um, this is a Western device, and hopefully that will change. I know China, I know the relations with China are kind of uh, difficult right now, but they certainly want to be part of this, and we should welcome them, I think. They've got some very good people. But the Event Horizon Telescope, and it was the one to discover the first black hole, uh, so that was in, um, in 2019, and a Nobel Prize the next year because of that, uh, but it was also used to, um, to identify the big or giant black holes at the center of almost every galaxy that we know about. 
So, um, and, uh, so the first pictures of a black hole, well, 55 billion light years away. Trans, uh, cross out the, uh, the light years, 55 billion uh, years away, meaning it took 55 billion years for the light to come from that black hole to the recording devices here. That's 10 million years after the dinosaurs disappeared. So that's how gigantic space really is. I mean, this is traveling at the speed of light to get here. That took all that time to get here. Uh, that's a long time. It's six billion times the mass of the, the sun, which is the first one that they spotted. And the size of it was gigantic. It, uh, it exceeded the size of our entire solar system. Our sun and all the planets, bigger than that. It's a giant, and it was captured by this international team. Um, and I mentioned this before, I, I really like this, this kind of project because if people working together, regardless of their color or nation and all that kind of thing, around the world, I can't think of anything of any other body that actually does that systematically and where they're actually productive. Something actually comes out of it. Uh, so I'm very pleased about that. And now this is a lot in here, but you know, there's a lot of data to be collected here. So they've shown it kind of diagrammatically three of these uh, radio telescopes, but there might be eight, seven or eight, maybe nine. And that data is kind of collected. And uh, on, these are on uh, giant computers and uh, they're initially processed and then uh, carried by airplane to a central site. Uh, all of these, the, the data collected from these uh, sites is synced by atomic clocks. So they're absolutely precise. So they, the correlation is, is excellent. There's so much data. There was so much data here. It took two years just to do the calculations with supercomputers. So that's a lot of data. And what did they get for? A pretty fuzzy picture over here of this black hole. But remember, this thing is a long, long way away. And to even get that is quite extraordinary. That's amazing. And uh, this same kind of picture, but there it is, Messier in 87, the first one, 55 million light years away, the distance that light will go in a year. And, uh, and this is the event horizon, right, right in here. You fall in, you're, you're, you're gone. Uh, but, uh, and the reason why this kind of lights up is that it's, there's a swirl of highly energetic um, uh, radiation and even and some matter spinning around outside this event horizon. So as fuzzy as it looks, by the way, somebody got a Nobel Prize for this, Roger. Roger Penrose and others got a Nobel Prize for this, uh, for work he had done on black holes. But anyway, so, well, what about the early history of dark stars or black holes? Yes? Dumb question. Um, Nothing is dumb here. Do we know uh, that, that because that took 55 billion years to get here, do we know that black holes still exist today? Uh, absolutely not. Had 55 million years to do something else. Or heaven knows. That's the problem with anything. Quasars, anything, any other phenomenon that happened a long time ago and it's taken a long time for the message to get here, we don't know what's happening now. We have no way of knowing what's happening now. We have no way of what's happening, what happened a hundred thousand years ago there, or millions of years ago, because of this long distance involved. And it's huge. Anyway, to Don Mitchell and uh, Pierre Simon uh, de Laplace reasoned that heavenly bodies could become so dense that they would be invisible. Not even light would be fast enough to escape the gravity. It's an interesting speculation. And it brings up who, who had the idea first. Uh, well, um, uh, they may have been first to the plate publicly about this kind of thing, but uh, 
but this is without any evidence. Um, so um, I think that kind of argument is a bit of spurious about who, uh, I mean, you can find Greek philosophers uh, speculating about the atom, but without evidence, what's the point of the speculation? It doesn't lead anywhere. Well, this fellow's an interesting fellow. I think I've introduced him to you before, Carl Schwarzschild. He's a fascinating fellow, a well-trained uh, physicist, uh, uh, and especially a very good mathematician. And uh, in 1916, he was attached to the German army on the Eastern Front, so he was actually fighting Russia. Uh, and, um, and he had time. Um, and uh, uh, Albert Einstein's um, paper on general relativity had come out a few months before, and uh, he was curious. He, he read it, and, and uh, he corresponded with, with uh, Albert Einstein several times back and forth. Uh, the one that, that we're interested in is the one at the bottom, um, and that is that he the thing that he pointed out to, to Einstein was that, uh, well, if a, if a mass, if, if something was so massive, was really massive, it could fold space-time around it and into what he called the singularity. He didn't mention black hole, but it could collapse into a singularity, something that's incredibly dense. But space-time, just for a moment on space-time, it's often, another, uh, yeah, it's often shown in this kind of Mickey Mouse way, uh, like a uh, tr like a um, a net or trapeze, and the mass kind of compresses it and, and distorts it. It certainly does, but it does it in all directions. This 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 kind of assumes it's in one plane uh, here, and uh, and it's not in one plane. It's in all planes, uh, but it's a hard thing to illustrate. But it's, um, I, I think of it as, uh, well, if I'm, um, if I'm uh, flying along, and well, I'm not going to take the time, but if I'm, if I'm in an airplane and I'm flying along, uh, then for space, uh, I need to know three, uh, three things. I need to know kind of where I'm going, like lateral kind of space, and how high I'm up. So that really triangulates me, right? So those are the three anchors of space, but also time, because I move from A to B. I repeat the same thing. So that's four dimensions of space-time. That's what's meant by it. And, and, and massive objects bend or warp, stretch that space-time fabric and, and can change time, slow time. Huge masses can actually slow time, slow a clock, not slowing the clock mechanically, but slow time, and bend time, and bend light, or for that matter, anything on the electromagnetic spectrum can be bent by large masses. And um, so we'll go back. No, I don't want to do that, so we'll just keep going here. Now, here's gravity. Now, most of this I've already mentioned here, but just to Gravity governs the orbits of planets of around the sun and the sun around the center of the Milky Way. Well, every 100,000 years or so, plus or minus 10 or 15,000 years, the climate changes uh, a lot. Move from a period of ice age into a warm period, right? That's a cycle that, that's dictated by the orbit or the ellipse changing from an almost a circular orbit to an elliptical orbit, and that changes the, the climate on Earth a lot. And in a warming period, when Earth, say, the North Africa and uh, northwest uh, Saudi Arabia was lush and there were lakes and water and animals, that was a time when people moved out of Africa and into Eurasia. And the traffic was probably both ways. Um, gravity is responsible for the birth of new stars. Well, you know that because that, that, that was the second talk I gave about the genesis or birth of, of stars. 
Um, matter in the universe, in the early universe, was, wasn't was uniform. If it were uniform, we'd have no stars. But it, it was a little, it, it, it wasn't uniform. And if it's not uniform, uh, then it means it's going to be more dense in one place than another. And in areas where it's dense, gravity can begin to act on it and compress it. And if you add in dark matter to that, and some giant black holes that apparently existed in the very early universe, you have gravity shaping the stellar, uh, the, these vast stellar clouds of hydrogen and maybe 20% helium uh, into um, swirling clouds and the dense centers became stars and, uh, and collections of these stars at different parts of this clumping thing would form other stars and go on and all you have a galaxy. So, so that's the idea. And uh, gravity causes dying stars to collapse. So we talked about that too in the, in the second one, meaning that uh, uh, stars are, are a balance between the, I mean, the, the, early, the earliest stars, uh, their energy came mostly or almost all from hydrogen, right? And hydrogen has one proton, so two protons, two hydrogen protons would fuse if the temperature and the pressure was high enough. If gravity had forced that hydrogen into a dense enough model to raise its pressure and temperature enough, nuclear fusion would take place. Fusion of these two protons would form a helium and in the process lose a little mass and create an enormous amount of energy. And the star lit up. And that works for as long as you have a, this kind of cheap, relatively cheap source of energy, meaning abundant hydrogen around. But these early stars burned through their hydrogen very rapidly. They were giant stars. They, they burned very brightly. And when they ran out of that, there was less uh, expansile force and, uh, and the same gravity, or more or less the same gravity, compressing the star. So the great crunch took place. And, um, and in that crunch, uh, the outer shell kind of collapsed into the core, great explosion, and uh, whatever elements were made up to, up to iron were scattered in the neighborhood to be picked up by the next generation of stars. I mean, that's something we talked about in the second session, but it, it, uh, it bears repeating. Um, so, uh, so that would be the supernova event, supernova, or kilonova, if it involved proton, or at least uh, neutron stars colliding. Gravity shapes space, uh, space-time. Um, it is interesting, isn't it, that uh, um, <laughs> you need an atomic clock to prove this, but uh, if I stand here, my feet are actually aging slower than my head. So I'm, I'm totally crazy, right? And just because of that minuscule little difference uh, away from the core of, of, of the Earth. But it is noticeable if you're in a if you're in a spacecraft orbiting the Earth. Now you have two things changing time. One is the speed, and time actually slows the higher the speed, but the higher up you are, you're actually aging fast. So those two kind of balance one another up. They don't quite do it. But they do, and they do have to factor them in in their calculations. So, um, well, the reason why I put this up is this is the not it, uh, Einstein's brilliant uh, general relativity in 2015, 2016. Uh, it's a masterpiece, and it doesn't come down to just one equation. But this is the central equation, and. Um, and some physicists would say, I think I've mentioned this before, um, uh, some people felt that uh, when general relativity came out, it was so beautiful, it was accepted before evidence. 
had shown that it was actually true. And, and, um, and physics, uh, theoretical physics is a little like that, uh, meaning that uh, they like simplicity, they like, um, uh, you know, equations that are basically simple, E is equal to MC squared, couldn't be simpler than that, in which it relates energy to mass and tells you that they're interchangeable for the proportionality to it. So some, some people look at an equation like that and say, gee, all that, a third of a line, to describe how a mass actually distorts space-time? Wow, how did you arrive at that one? And um, uh, uh, I like this one, John Wheeler, because I, you know, to make a simple statement like this, and it's absolutely true, you really have to understand the stuff. And he said, matter tells space-time how to curve, and curved space tells matter how to move. It's quite nice, isn't it? Um, one half of this is, or at least this is one half of the equation, that's the other side of the equation that you just saw. So isn't that lovely? I mean, there is a beauty in that. And, um, now, black holes, and they vary a lot in size. Uh, I mean, the uh, first one I introduced this afternoon was uh, up, in the, up in the billions, uh, 55 billion uh, mass, solar masses, meaning the mass of our sun. So these are millions or billions of times the mass of our sun. Intermediate size, 20 to 20 to 50. I don't know what the speculation of quantum size went. I don't know any evidence to support that. But theoretical physicists uh, know no bounds uh, sometimes, and maybe they're right. I don't know. I have no clue. Uh, there's certainly no evidence of that that I know about. Now, um, I'm just going to go down right to the bottom here because uh, for the last 30 years, people have suspected that there's a giant black hole or something like that at the center of the Milky Way. Why? Because, uh, because the trajectory of some stars or heavenly bodies near the central part of the, of the Milky Way seemed distorted. There had to be some big mass there uh, kind of changing the course of these stars. And, uh, and that was the early speculation. That's why these groups, there's a group in uh, Germany at the Max Planck, Genzel, who got a Nobel Prize, was shared it in uh, 2020. Um, uh, and an American group, they were competing, uh, the two groups, uh, and each got a share of the prize. And, uh, and they were both looking at the central part of the Milky Way. And what they couldn't see the black hole itself. All they could see were the orbits of, of stars around these black holes. And, and just working backwards from those orbits, predicted that there had to be something really massive there influencing the observed trajectories of these stars. Follow what I'm saying? And uh, so... Um, and that's what that was all about. So long before, um, so Sagittarius A, um, located 26,000 light years from the, from the sun. That's a long way away. That means our giant black hole is, uh, it takes light 26,000 years to get from that massive black hole to our telescope. 26,000. Divide that by what a generation would be, say, let's say uh, 20 years or 30 years, divide that into it, and you come up with, with several thousand generations, successive generations, uh, if you were to travel there at the speed of light, and that's at the speed of light. So it's a long, long way away. It's a giant black hole, a long, long way away in the center of the Milky Way. Now, I, I left 
this is really a quotation. After I like the, the, the phrase in it. After following the star in its orbit, imagine the discipline to do this and keeping a team together to collect the data. After following the star in its orbit for over two and a half decades of funding that had to be there, our exquisite measurement, he's not bragging here, he's saying that they're really exquisite. Measurements robustly detected the precession in its path around, in other words, it explained the distortion of the orbit of the stars around something that had to be there. And uh, I think it was quite a nice way of putting it. Um, well, there's the, the, the FAB 3 in 2020. Roger Penrose was 89 at the time. By the way, the work for which he got his Nobel Prize on black holes, he did uh, in his early 30s. He was 89 when he got the prize. Um, and why all that? Because, uh, uh, you know, until a black hole was actually seen in 2019, the Nobel Committee was very reluctant to award a Nobel Prize for work on black holes, like show us the, the black hole. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why that was so important in 2019, but it, uh, the tragedy because uh, Stephen Hawking was dead by that time. And there are no posthumous awards or Nobel Prizes. Uh, Andrew Hees is the, uh, is the American, uh, head of the American group, and Reinhard Gintel, group at Max Planck doing complementary but also competitive studies, and it's kind of a good illustration that you had two top-notch groups uh, uh, trying to solve the same problem with the same kind of technology, not sharing the stuff, not working as a team, and they came out with almost exactly the same result. So that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. Uh, he, these are these are uh, experimental physicists and groups, and this would involve hundreds of uh, engineers and, and, astro and, uh, and uh, experimental um, uh, physicists. And here's a third of the prize. No, um, in fact, I think that half of this prize went to Roger Penrose. He was the theoretical physicist who, with a piece of paper, like Einstein, did the equations and got no team here. Uh, no big budget here, and figuring out the geometry of the inside of the black hole. Um, and so there we are, Roger Penrose. One of the reasons why they gave him that is that, uh, well, in the language of the Nobel Committee, for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust, good word, robust, prediction of the general theory of relativity. So that came out in uh, 1915 and 16. Here we are in, uh, in 2020, and the committee looked at all of the data and said, hey, we finally got it. Uh, and, uh, and that came with the demonstration of the, of the black hole. So Roger Penrose, and then these, these are the two experimental Groups and the theoretical physicists were working out his own in Oxford. Um, this is a little repetitive, but most galaxies, I would say probably all galaxies, have a supermassive black hole near the center. Now we tend to think of black holes as kind of a uh, kind of a bad thing, kind of sucking stars into it and matter and various other things and dangerous, but it's actually a very creative force. Uh, it, it shapes the trajectories of stars and matter uh, that then coalesce together to form stars. So in all of the stuff whirling around giant black holes, stars are being formed. So it's not altogether a bad thing. They're not falling into the black hole, at least not for maybe billions of years or millions of years. Um, Now, here's, oh, here we are. So, Sagittarius A, if 
a way they finally see that. Uh, it's at the center of the Milky Way. It's five to six times the mass of our sun, so it's kind of, um, it's not often the billion mark. It's a very bright corona, that bright white ring kind of around the outside, uh, composed of, uh, and, and it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's energy across the electromagnetic spectrum, and it's highly energetic, and it's spinning around, and it's extremely hot. And maybe some particles, maybe some elementary particles, but don't expect any rocks unless the temperature is too high. And it's that light that's picked up, the quantum of light across that electromagnetic spectrum that's picked up by devices on Earth or in by satellites. Now there is this interesting thing, I think I mentioned this before. Remember I, at the beginning I said that with the, with the Big Bang, the expansion of the universe, all, uh, I said, all the, all the galaxies are speeding away from one another, and the further away they are, the faster they're moving. Well, they're not all speeding away from one another, because our nearest or neighboring uh, galaxy, um, which is um, Andromeda, um, is due to merge with our galaxy, the Milky Way, um, in around three million years. Uh, which prompted that interesting observation by, uh, uh, by uh, it's a fellow who was using his own um, home telescope, and uh, he was looking at Andromeda, and it kind of dawned on him that the light uh, that had reached his, his retina had begun its voyage at Andromeda at about the time Lucy was walking around in East Africa, so over three million years. So that's our, our nearest neighbor is three million years away. Uh, isn't that extraordinary? It's, it really is. And it tells you that even if, if galaxies merge, the chances of actual stars and planets hitting one another is really infinitesimally small because there's so much space there between them. So. Maybe collisions, but we don't know that. But gravitational interactions, for sure, the two black holes will probably become one. And there's some evidence that the, these black holes kind of uh, join up and link together from several galaxies from these mergers. And that, that might be how the universe ends, with some really gargantuan black hole form. Anyway, we we will never know that. Uh, here's a super simple map. Here's the center of the galaxy. There's Sagittarius A. Uh, there are, there is us, our sun, and, and um, our solar system here. But look at that, 26,000 light years uh, to go from here to there, or, or back. 26,000 light years. 26,000 years. That is a long time. Uh, so I don't think we're going to be making that trip anytime soon. And that's another picture. It, it shows you the, in this one, Sagittarius, why they had so much trouble uh, actually photographing Sagittarius A. Was that there's so, so many planets, or no, not so many planets, so many stars circling and buzzing around this kind of giant black hole at the center of, the, of our galaxy, that that's what you see. It's hard to see this giant black hole through all that stuff. So you see this really bright spot, but you don't see the black hole. Now, well, what, did, uh, what was Penrose's big idea in 1964? 1964, he was born in 1933. Uh, so there he is, he was 33. And uh, lived and spent his whole career in Oxford, was raised in Oxford, outside Oxford, and uh, like uh, many um, theoretical physicists, he had a great idea while he was walking. And, uh, and uh, he had this idea that, that uh, well, what, you know, the truth is we don't know what's going on inside a black hole. We do not. Uh, there is no spaceship that's going to go in there and come back out and tell us what's going on. No device 
place, you look in there. So all of it is speculation, it's all theoretical. And, um, but he, uh, but his model uh, suggested that, that there must be something incredibly dense, which he used that same language, singularity, that Schwarzschild, a few slides back, mentioned, uh, of something incredibly dense, the, kind, the same language used at the moment of creation of the universe, that is singularity. Something incredibly dense and small at the center of both of us. And his equations gave some shape to that. And I'm not going to get into it because I don't understand his equations. But um, somebody, uh, somebody, that's the model uh, in, in, in the paper. That was, uh, yeah, 1965. Uh, in his paper, and the Nobel Committee repeated that figure. Uh, just to, and this is the singularity that the kind of the core that's really, really, really dense, and matter outside is kind of progressively collapsing as a gravitational um, pull grabs it, and then it becomes trapped on the inside. Well, um, I want to say something about general relativity. Anyone who's listened to me uh, realizes I'm a little uh, biased. Very bright guy, uh, for a lot of reasons, and that he was human, very human guy, and he made mistakes, big ones, uh, which we're going to talk about. But uh, the consequences of general relativity, an expanding universe that accounts for the, the Big Bang and the expansion, and perhaps an end to the to the uh, to the universe. Gravitational lensing. Well, um, I'm going to show you a slide in just a moment about that. But, but uh, sometimes when you're looking out or, or trying to look at something, something's in the way. It might be a whole galaxy. It might be a kind of giant star or a collection of stars. But somehow you can't see what you're trying to look see because of this intervening stuff. Uh, well, um, it turns out that uh, that the light from from that thing otherwise hidden is bent going around the obstruction and you can't see it. In fact, you'll see multiple versions of it. And uh, it's called gravitational lensing. Gravitational waves, meaning that space-time, that, uh, that kind of jiggly uh, four-dimensional entity that we were talking about, that if you have two massive objects collide get these ripples that spread out through space-time, and, uh, and they're detectable. Now we know they are detectable, because the Nobel Prize was given in, 19, uh, in 2017 for that, and the observation actually made two years earlier. I mentioned earlier, time varies with speed. Uh, that was the special relativity, and, uh, and gravity, general relativity. Um, now here's the gravitational lensing. Uh, here you are, looking here, and you're trying to see this. But between you and between you and it is some massive object, could be a, a whole galaxy or part of one or, or just one giant star that has a gravitational field. The light from that source bends as it goes around this dent and slows, bends and slows. Uh, time slows as it goes around the curve here, and then speeds up again. And you can pick it up, but you can see there's an apparent object here at several places here, okay? Uh, it, it's brilliant, it's, it's using uh, like the lens in our eyes to see something um, uh, that would otherwise be obstructed. You're actually using uh, the, that property of mass bending space-time to actually see things that otherwise you couldn't see. Now, I've shown you this slide before. This is the 19, uh, where the 2015 paper. Uh, this is obviously not a, this is a, 
is an illustration of what they look like. But these were two black holes circling one another in a dance that had been probably going, been going on for millions and millions and millions of years. And, and eventually, they kind of collide. And when they collide, these great ripples go out in space-time. By the time they get here, which is, um, what is it, uh, more than a billion light years ago, it took a billion years for the light from this collision to get to the detectors here on Earth. So to your question earlier, no, we don't know what's happening right there now. Whatever it is, it's probably long since over. But, uh, but anyway, here are the two of them. And, um, and here, the, you know, this is ours kind of playing with these kind of ripples going out from uh, space time. And, uh, and I've shown this one before too because uh, it's incredible engineering to do this. I mean, how would you pick up something that detects a movement or a distortion uh, maybe half a proton in length. How would you do that? Well, you have two arms at right angles to one another. This is a, uh, there are two of these in the United States, this one in Italy and several others now, and China is trying to do the same. So this is four kilometers long. They're at right angles to one another. So if, for example, the gravitational waves come in this direction, right here, it'll hardly change this, the length of this, very much, but it'll change the length of this. And you're looking at the differential, the time difference for a laser beam to go down here, bounce back, and uh, reach home plate here. I mean, they should be with no gravitational waves. And you send the same light beam or divide it and send it up here and it comes right back here and the same here. They should arrive at precisely the same time. But if the length of one of the arms changes, they won't. And they didn't. And if you convert that signal into sound waves, you get what was called a chirp. 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 And literally, it sounds like that. And that tells you that somewhere, uh, something massive happened a long time ago, and the signal was really weak by the time it's got here. It's like uh, if I dropped a stone in the middle of Lake Ontario, or even a big boulder in the middle of Lake Ontario, uh, and then I go down to Montreal and expect to pick it up. Well, it will be part of the ripple, but imagine how small it is by the time it gets there. So, um, so it's really very, I mean, excellent exact example of engineering. Well, what we don't know, um, the, the problem, the, the basic, one of the big problems in, um, in physics or in the, the, the scientific creation story right now is it really has two, two, um, two areas that, that uh, don't dance well together at all. One is general relativity that uh, applied to the to the, um, everything kind of large, what I call the, the, the universe writ large, uh, which is highly predictive, extremely highly predictive, and works really well, and every test of it is turned up uh, uh, to confirm that general relativity is right. Then there's quantum mechanics, which we covered in the Nobel series, with this whole business of uncertainty, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and some pretty weird stuff going on, and um, where the rules seem to be somewhat different. And where are those rules, when do they come together, those two sets of rules? At the creation of the universe. In those first few moments of the universe, it started out as, a, as probably a quantal field, obeying, obeying quantal laws. But within Seconds, it become general relativity rules. And in black holes. Black holes, the two coexist. And, uh, and um, or at least we think they do. I mean, I th 
one of the thoughts that I have in kind of reading this stuff is I'm not sure that there isn't a third. Um, I mean, the, the Big Bang, I, um, the, um, those first few moments in, in the Big Bang, however short they actually were, um, or however tiny the beginning actually was, had to be maybe something before quantum physics or mechanics and before and certainly before general relativity. There's something basic to that. And the reason why I bring that up is the Nobel Prize this year in physics was given to the group that uh, that Einstein had been very unhappy with quantum mechanics, even though he was the father of quantum physics. Mechanics, uh, he was very unhappy with it. He certainly didn't like the, the, the idea of uncertainty. And he posed a, a problem, and, um, and no one could solve it until the group uh, this year, so last year, at least for the award, uh, had shown, well, it was, you know, that uh, Einstein was wrong. But, but Einstein thought more deeply than that. He, he thought that, uh, yes, there are real problems with both of them. I think there's something underneath both of them that explains both. And that, and uh, I mean, he never stated this, but my guess is those points are in a black hole and at the beginning of the universe. Because if you imagine, uh, do quantum rules really to something that's incredibly right off the temperature charts and so much energy in such a tiny, small space. There is no experiment to do that. There's no way of actually figuring that out. And in black holes, as far as I'm concerned, think it's a it's a it's a um, information vacuum. Uh, meaning we have no way of getting into a black hole to figure out what's going on. There. So, um, so well, there I was say it, but what's needed is this theory that unites both, absolutely. But I think uh, Albert's right, there's something underlying both of them. Whether anyone solves that, um, Stephen Weinberg, uh, whom I ad admire, he died uh, last year, but a particle physicist uh, who was kind of the father, one of the fathers of the standard model in physics, quantum mechanics, and he brought up the interesting notion, you know, humans may not be bright enough to figure some of these things out. Um, it's just not within the capacity of the human brain, even a collective uh, brains working together to figure this stuff out. It's just, it's just, it's beyond us. And uh, it's an interesting thought. So what would happen if you jumped into a black hole? Well, if you... Uh, watch Miller or other things like that, uh, all kinds of wild speculation about it. But the fact is, we don't know. And, and the density is so, I can't imagine that there are any particles that survive this crushing gravitational force. It must all be all energy. And um, if it's all energy, where does the mass come from? Um, so I don't know. Now, quasars, uh, being a pilot, is quite interested in this because uh, quasars are giant black holes, supermassive ones, like that one that uh, I introduced at the, at the beginning, even larger than that, that formed early in the universe, very early. And they played a big role in shaping these gaseous masses. And, um, but one thing about them, is that they're so massive, they have a huge corona, crown, around the event horizon that's highly energetic and extremely bright, so bright that even 13.456 billion years later, we can see them clearly. And they're stationary. They're not going anywhere. So there, if you're navigating space, you can't use uh, GPS 
There's some guy looking out of the window and saying, oh, I think that's such and such. I mean, much outside of the, uh, outside of our solar system. Where, where are the navigational beacons? Where are your reference points? Well, quasars are perfect reference points. They're very bright, kind of, I say relevant, but easy to see, and extremely precise in their location. Now, back to the <laughs> questions here. Um, they're fixed in a position, but fixed in a position, uh, 13.6, but it takes taken that long for the light to get here. Heaven knows where they move to now, or even whether those quasars actually exist now. And I don't know. And as a practical point, we need a beacon out there that if you if we ever get to interstellar travel, we need reference points. And uh, and they are certainly one. Now Einstein's mistakes, and here we are. Not exactly a book about this. But well, first of all, failing to see that his equations for general relativity predicted an expanding universe. You know, um, this wasn't a, uh, a science thing for him. He, uh, his philosophy, for, for some reason he felt that a universe had to be steady. It, 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 I don't mean that things weren't whirling around in, in a Newtonian fashion, but uh, he believed in a universe that had no beginning and no end. He believed it. Um, and, uh, and he really just couldn't bring himself. And several people came to him and said, and nicely, and said, look, just follow your own math. Uh, if he had gone along with that, there's Nobel Prize number two. He got it for general relativity. But then he made this huge mistake uh, because uh, he, he finally acknowledged that the equations as they were predicted an expanding universe. He said, well, I'll put a cosmological constant into the equations that will fix that. And it did. It kind of brought the expanding universe to a dead stop. But trouble is, the real data show that, uh, I mean, the actual observations show that the universe was Hubble and other people show that, that, that most galaxies, galaxies were speeding away from one another. So then he quickly yanked the thing back. Then dark energy emerges in, um, in, the, in the 1980s, which almost exactly equates to the cosmological constant. Figure out it makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, because he put in just enough to slow the thing down and stop it, which would equal the expansile force of dark energy. It makes sense. Um, and he didn't, uh, uh, well, so I said, by my count, his failures might have justified five Nobel Prizes. Uh, one for general relativity. Um, uh, and he didn't even get the Nobel Prize for general relativity. This is, now, just finish on this note, Lawrence Krauss wrote his book, The Universe from Nothing. One of the most poetic facts I know about the universe is that every atom in your body was once inside a star that exploded. Moreover, the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than did, than did those in your right hand. We are all literally star children, and our bodies are made of stardust. Absolutely. That's where the elements came from. We are composed of those life elements that I've harped on several times here, and it's the same formula for everyone and all life. And, um, and where did they come from? They came from uh, those stars. They came from nuclear fusion. And then the cores of stars, or sometimes in supernova, or ultimately from the heaviest elements, but none of them are life elements, uh, and neutron star collisions. So next week, so I, 
I started out this thing saying I, I thought that, there, that, that, that a science creation story um, is emerging for sure in my own thinking, and uh, and and I think it's a very interesting, it's a very robust one. It doesn't mean that there that there is no law we don't know that remains mystery. Absolutely. It it also as it emerges. Um, it has similarities to other creation stories. Uh, talking to my daughter the other day up in Alaska, and she was talking about Aboriginal peoples there and some of their stories. I mean, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these stories, and most of them are all gone because they've you know, uh, disappeared. And uh, but they they're common themes, and that one of the most central probably the most central theme of all. Is one of creation, a beginning, an interim, an end, and something else happening around the circle as the stars. Remember, I said the birth of this gravitational shifting of, of, of uh, matter to form stars, nuclear fusion ignites, the stars alive, it's bright, it runs out of hydrogen, it's, a, it's, a, it's best source of energy. And, and it either fizzles out, like our sun is about to do in about four billion years, uh, or if it's a larger star, it, uh, it takes you know, the supernova explosion. But in doing that, it seeds the elements that it's created in the neighborhood to be picked up by new, uh, it's like a nursery, a giant nursery. So whatever was left, from the death of, of the star didn't go into the rubbish heap. Some of it was picked up by newly forming stars and gravi gravitationally being pulled together. So new life out of death. That is a really common theme in creation stories, a really common theme. So I think people intuitively pick that up uh, over, the, over the many millennia. How far back do those stories go? I don't know, um, but probably, I would think at least 100,000 years, and that's probably conservative. Probably goes back 150, 200,000 years, but maybe even longer. Depends on how well developed the stories were. I think they were very well developed by the time uh, they, on the cave art period, meaning the, the great cave art period in, in Europe. By that time, you're looking at very mature, um, not a beginning of quite a mature understanding of, of beliefs and relationships to animals and nature and that kind of thing. And um, uh, so there must have been something before that. What there wasn't was something around a million years ago, or maybe half a million years ago. So Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Uh, so uh, those stories have been around for a very And, just to finish off this whole thing, if you, as I've tried to drop the seed and the preceding ones, life is probably very abundant in the universe. It's almost certainly carbon based because it's the same laws of physics apply. And in chemistry, why wouldn't it be? What else would it be? Unless you think it's creating different laws. So it's carbon based. And um, and um, and just on the odds on numbers, uh, it's probably abundant. The trouble is, it's out of reach. I mean, twenty six thousand years to get to the center of our galaxy. We're not even out of the galaxy. You haven't left the parking lot. Uh, and um, so, but as far as numbers go, and elsewhere, and then just imagine. That if somebody, I've mentioned this to you before, if somebody came by looking for life, I mean, orbit around the Earth or using remote detectors, and, uh, and they were around before the Cambrian explosion, before 550 million years ago. So that's only half a million years ago. But before that, for that three billion years before that, what was there to see? You'd be buzzing around and look 
looking at all kinds of things. What, what was the evidence of life here? Um, not much. So I think life is very abundant, and if it is, it means that uh, given the odds, intelligent life is almost certainly happening or happen, happening or will happen uh, in other places. And what will their creation stories be? What will they think about our creation stories? Never mind us. I mentioned that book last week. Uh, the the one of the fellow who was creating the uh, you know the the uh, recreating skulls and, and bodies for the Smithsonian Institute. And he, you know, he's had a lot of experience. Talks to a lot of people in, in the field and uh, understands the biology. And he says, well, it'll have two outcomes for us. One is we will evolve. That's a possibility if we don't do ourselves in. But we will continue to evolve. We will not remain the same. We have never remained the same. If, if the past is prologue to the future, and I see no reason why it wouldn't be, then future species along our lines will hopefully, hopefully, be more intelligent than we are. And uh, almost certainly their gut will change, and their lungs and various other par parts of their thing because of the dietary habits will change as we have versus apes. And, uh, and so we'll change, the brain will change. The brain is changing. It changed a lot in the last 300,000 years. And uh, so why wouldn't we think that would continue to change? So that possibility one, we're lucky enough to make it and evolve, but not as us. Something different. Or option two is like the other 95% of our predecessors, we go extinct. I mean, if you look at the historical fossil record, by my last count, there are over 40 antecedent species to us, and that only goes back three million years. So, um, a lot of species have died. Neanderthals are extinct. The Denisovans, we have genetic evidence for them. They've gone. All the other groups in all, almost well, in all of human prehistory there were almost always two or three or sometimes four hominin species that coexisted, sometimes in the same place. Um, this is really the first time that one species is lone survivor. And so we will be the stem of the next so that's where I think it's going. Um, uh, it's safe for me to say any of that kind of stuff because uh, I don't know and you don't know. But I do think we can use the evidence of the past <coughs> to, to at least point the arrow of time and speak sensibly about where things might go. And so some of our human behaviors that are so destructive, um, I mean, it does seem crazy, doesn't it? The, the Carl Sagan moment when he looked back at the, at the little green planet and realized that all of human history had taken place on that damn little speck. All of human history. No exception. So why can't they get along? And they don't. Our species has, uh, unlike almost every other species, has a, um, has a nasty part to it, nasty connected to it, and it is within us. It's not outside of us. It isn't some kind of evil force out there, and there's some good force out there that, that, that kind of abdicates any responsibility for it. The responsibility is here with us, which is, um, which is I think, one of the lessons of the science creation story is not going to take over all other creation stories, nor, nor would it ever claim to. 
but it does have, it points us in some directions to be interesting. So on to next week, and we'll see where we go. It's kind of fun, right? Okay, any questions? Yes? Uh, just about the Big Bang Theory and yeah. the end of the book. When you use the word creation of the universe, do you mean like creation of matter, or is it just how the matter explodes? <laughs> oh, well, uh, believe it, the word explode is kind of a loaded one. I mean, it, it sounds like a gun flashed or something like that. But, uh, no, I mean, uh, where everything in its most elemental form, <coughs> forces and particles, came into being. Now the problem was, as you would, were hitting at, uh, we don't really actually know what was there mm. exactly before, and how long it had been in there, and what preceded that. Mm. Now Roger Penrose, the fellow that I alluded to, who's got the Nobel on 2020, he certainly speculates, and um, you can hear him or watch him on YouTube, he's actually quite entertaining. Uh, Roger Penrose. Oh. Yeah. Uh, R O G E R. Yeah, Penrose. And, uh, but he says, well, um, the universe will come to an end. And, um, but, uh, but, um, I don't know whether to introduce this whole thing. I don't know what the time is like. But just, just a second. One of the things that rules where how the direction the universe is taken is the second law of thermodynamics. The first one says that in a closed system, meaning the universe, the sum total of all the energy is the same. It doesn't change. You can't add to it, you can't subtract to it from it. The second law is the crucial one because it says that may be so, but some energy is slowly becoming unusable. Uh, you can't kind of gather it up and use it again. It becomes, uh, in the uh, words of the 1800s, entropic. And, uh, but, but the energy becomes useless if you, and, um, and, that, and that's cumulative. So you would need some mechanism for refreshing that, restoring it back to its non-entropic state. Uh, it's not that the laws of thermodynamics are wrong, they're not. And that's what Roger Penrose is saying. So he, so if you take his circular argument, he would say, well, the universe expands, and then at some point, um, I think he visualizes, and some other people, that, that like a sweeper, these black holes get larger and larger and larger, and eventually kind of gather all of the matter and energy in the universe together in one place, guess what, becomes the singularity, where all energy is restored to its non-entropic state. So you start out fresh. Then, the new universe can bud from that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a beautifully circular, I mean, it makes sense to me, but, um, uh, but the idea of entropy, I mean, it's, it's like um, uh, you cook something in the in the kitchen, right? And the, the natural gas or use electricity, use electricity to source for that. The energy was in the gas. If you're changing the molecular composition to make that gas, and it's giving off energies, only some of which you're actually using. The rest is dissipating into the room, into the house, into the outdoors. It's no longer accessible. It's gone. And out of every car exhaust, the same thing is happening. And uh, energy is being converted to, into an unusable form. You can't corral it. You can't bring it back into the same place. You can in a black hole. You just suck it all in and compact it. But otherwise, the energy is gone. Fortunately, the universe has so much uh, usable energy, and sometimes it, it, uh, it um, so 
sometimes it uh, sometimes it almost you you kind of beat the second law of thermodynamics briefly by uh, and that's what happens sometimes in stars you know when you when you uh, you bring those those, those uh, protons together from two hydrogen nuclei and and they fuse and you create this enormous amount of energy but of course as soon as I've said that you realize that the sunlight that's falling on us is a tiny little fraction a tiny 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 little fraction uh, of the of the energy that the sun is releasing and where the hell is the rest of it going and is it doing any good out there you know, it's gone. So um, anyway, so we'll see. But next week we'll um, we'll uh, get back. We'll get more into the, the the stories because I think that's an important part here. So um, uh, might think about uh, stuff and bring bring your questions next week. Um, I'm going to get a couple of people to read it, the passages next week. So that that. Um, so, I, it's interesting stuff, isn't it? It is. Okay, well, so next week, same time and place.